Well, we are at the end of the year 2023, and I'm here talking to my colleague Larry Diamond. Uh, Larry has just gotten back from Washington, where he gave the, what is it, the 17th annual? 20th. Oh, 20th. Annual. Okay, 20th uh, annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture uh, at the Canadian Embassy in conjunction with the National Endowment for Democracy. I believe that I gave the second of these lectures, so that was 18 years ago. You were near the ago. beginning, I'm the most recent. You're the most recent. Uh, so this is available on YouTube. I'll put the link uh, to the okay. actual lecture. But Larry, maybe um, you can just uh, talk a little bit about you know what the substance of your lecture was and, and what the message was for that, uh, that audience uh, on the general state of democracy in the okay. world. Well, um, uh, I think I had three purposes. One was to assess the state of democracy in the world. The second was, and to explain why I think we're still in quite a serious democratic recession. <clears throat> the second was to explain why the recession has been happening. And the third is to think about how we might reverse it and renew global democratic momentum. So we'll start with the first theme, mm -hmm. which is the question you asked, how are we doing? And I think that although Freedom House reflected at the end of last year in its annual ratings, somewhat aspirationally, but also on the basis of some data that possibly the democratic recession was drawing to a close because 2022 was the first year in about, I don't know, 16 years that there weren't many more countries declining in their annual freedom score compared to the number that were improving. And so they said, we've been through a very dark period over the decade and a half roughly, M maybe we're reaching the end of it. It didn't seem that way to me at the time at the end of 2022. That's the way it came out for mm -hmm, them statistically. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the trends at the end of last year, um, in terms of the continuing erosion of democracy in big and important countries like India and Mexico, it just didn't feel that way. Now, here we are a year later at the end of 2023, and, you know, we can look at a balance sheet where there are some positive things that like we can Poland. note. The most, uh, Frank, the most overwhelmingly important positive development has been the victory, the elect recent electoral victory for democratic forces in Poland. I think this is huge. Uh, I mean, you don't want to make judgments on the basis of favoring this party rather than that party. But when a political party like Law and Justice, which had been ruling for 10 years in Poland, is clearly doing authoritarian things, closing down civic space, harassing people, trying to politicize the judiciary, um, punishing independent media and so on, and creating an illiberal and authoritarian atmosphere, not to mention uh, abusive uh, postures toward minorities and immigrants and so on. I mean, what can you say except mm -hmm. there's an authoritarian trend? And Poland, unlike Hungary, in my opinion, Poland had not crossed the line into being mm -hmm. a non-democracy, but it was clearly trending in that direction. And people worried about what would happen if it got a third mm -hmm. term in office. So I think that the victory of this democratic coalition led by the former prime minister, Donald Tusk, was uh, enormously significant mm -hmm. and inspiring because they ran a pro-democracy campaign. They also had very specific platforms to address the economic issues and concerns of polls and the corruption of the previous ruling government, very importantly. So we learned some lessons from their election campaign, but they won. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a victory for democracy uh, in Poland. Unfortunately, that comes up on top of the uh, victory for authoritarianism in Hungary again in 2022 and the victory for Orban 
uh, for Erdogan, uh, the ruling authoritarian incumbent in Turkey, uh, more recently. So the good news is that we do see electoral alternation in some places. You do see instances where illiberal populists and even authoritarian populists or authoritarian-minded ones are defeated. It can happen. We can draw hope from that. And you do see instances, I note them in my lecture, where um, democracy seems to be holding. Okay. Uh, I think some people are concerned about uh, some of the ongoing trends in Brazil and some of the, uh, you know, maybe left-leaning populism uh, of Lula and some of the people that work with him, President Lula mm -hmm. da Silva in Brazil. But, uh, I mean, a clearly authoritarian-minded incumbent, Jair Bolsonaro, was defeated mm -hmm. in Brazil uh, at the end of 2022, and I think he was trying to canvas for staying in office, and he failed. Uh, by the way, I think he failed in part because of U.S. Uh, signaling that mm -hmm. it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't support that, and that there'd be very serious consequences if Brazil defected from democracy. More recently, you know, Chile tried to pass this crazy constitution, which was full of, uh, I'd say, illiberal impulses in terms of trying to write social and, and environmental and um, identity politics mm -hmm. into the constitution, which is not where they belong. And the Chilean po population, which was ready for a new kind of post-authoritarian constitution, said, no, this is not what mm -hmm. a liberal democratic constitution mm -hmm. should look like, mm -hmm. and they defeated it, and now there's a new attempt at constitution right. writing in Chile. Um, you know, other democracies in Latin America are kind of hanging on. It's, it's a bit of a mixed picture. In Argentina, I think it's a bit um, uh, early to judge uh, how to interpret the recent presidential election, and even very recent presidential inauguration of Javier Millet. Uh, at this point, my view is there are two ways to interpret it, and I don't have a view between them. One way is that uh, the Peronistas had disgraced themselves by their corruption and grotesque economic mismanagement, uh, landing the country into what, more than 100% inflation or something like 150. that? And, uh, you know, now 40% of the population is below the poverty line. And so um, the proper response to that is electoral alternation and a different party and a different vision of economic management. And so I think it's good for democracy that they got punished by the normal mm -hmm. play of electoral cycles. The question that a lot of Argentines and observers have is, you know, Javier Millet and his radical libertarianism is a pretty dramatic uh, change. Will whatever he does in terms of economic policy, dollarizing the economy or not, will he ad adhere to constitutional norms in the next five years? Some of our common friends in Argentina believe and are hopeful that he will, and that would be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a reaffirmation of democracy in Argentina. I have a little bit of concern that, you know, he's got some demagogic tendencies that may tempt him in another direction. But the last time Argentina had this... Um, encounter with demagogic populism under uh, Menem, they did stop short, the country did stop short of veering toward outright authoritarianism. So maybe that will happen again. Anyway, the summary point is there is a class of important countries uh, that are third wave democracies that are kind of persisting, and a few the best example mm -hmm. is Taiwan, mm -hmm. that have really improved and are doing very well, where mm -hmm. democracy is liberal and vibrant and resilient and so on. 
The other side of the story, and apologies for the long-winded answer, is that there are a lot of democracies that maybe haven't broken down yet, but are sure, sure trending in that mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And um, the one, as you know, that I am most worried about is India. This is the biggest democracy in the world, and um, it is in the grip of severe and relentless illiberal and authoritarianizing trends mm -hmm. under uh, Narendra Modi and his BJP ruling party. And some of it has to do with the assaults on the press and the very dramatic decay in part because of self-censorship, of press autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, press criticism, uh, 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 press independence of what was once a pretty uh, pluralistic and independent-minded and critical press. This has ex extended to the arts. The Washington Post recently ran uh, a, a, an important article about um, censorship and self-censorship in the film industry mm -hmm. where critical uh, filmmakers can't get films made and Netflix won't run them or finance them that appear to be critical of the ruling party and the government um, or even upholding of liberal uh, values. Yeah. And of course, you know, our summer fellows this past summer, we had several from India yeah. and there was some pushback uh, against this um, uh, deterioration story because they said, you know, opposition parties on a state level continue to fight vigorously. They win uh, occasionally, uh, and it's not clear that those elections were manipulated. Uh, so uh, that's a very important point, and it raises the question that I ponder in the lecture of what is the line between democracy and competitive authoritarianism? And I think the line is that you have to have free and fair elections. In the end, you can have in a liberal democracy um, where there is a lot of pressure on civil society, mm -hmm. the arts, uh, the universities. Uh, at what point does that descend into being a competitive authoritarian regime? If the censorship the pressure, the threats, the intimidation, don't reach the point where um, they dramatically erode the freedom and fairness of electoral contestation, then I think what you have is an illiberal and even very illiberal democracy, and that's worrisome enough, and we can criticize mm -hmm. that. The question is, what do we call India? What do we call Hungary? Uh, what do we call a lot of these countries that are in motion in those directions? To my mind, it's no longer ambiguous. Orban has so degraded the competitive environment for electrical, electoral districting, uh, administration, uh, of elections, mm -hmm. although people are not arguing that there's outright fraud on election day, access to the media and so on, I just adamantly uh, assert that Hungary is not a democracy, that the, the arena for electoral contestation now is so distorted that it's become a competitive authoritarian regime, although a very skillful one you can have a competitive authoritarian regime where uh, ruling parties lose. It's happened a, a number of times, including in all the color revolutions and others. Uh, and you get turnover, and it's surprising, but it doesn't mean it was a democracy at the time that the ruling party lost and was um, forced to surrender power. In the case of India, yes, it isn't clear yet mm -hmm. that the machinery of electoral administration has been compromised, although the ruling BJP 
is now putting pressure on the Electoral Commission of India in a way that hasn't happened before. The courts have less autonomy and independence than they used to have. The media has less autonomy and independence than they used to have. And so it's, I think India has entered a gray zone. The proof of a country being a democracy is not that the ruling party loses some elections. Keep in mind in Mexico, under the PRI, particularly in the later years, when no serious uh, objective political scientist would have suggested in the 1980s that Mexico was a democracy, the PRI still lost some state elections. Mm -hmm. The question is, can people choose and replace their leaders in free and fair elections, most especially at the national level? And they still can in Mexico, uh, even if uh, Lopez Obrador's favorite candidate wins uh, next year in 2024. They still could in Poland and did. Can they in, in India? Probably. Um, probably. They won't because the, this is another point our, our participants and friends have made, which is a fair point that the opposition it's is so yeah. incompetent mm -hmm. and is so much in the grip of uh, a family dynasty uh, and so uninspiring that, you know, uh, the election will not be that competitive for several reasons and the um, inefficacy of the opposition is an important one. So anyway, I think India is in a gray zone. Other countries are not. A lot of countries are receding from democracy. Some have fallen below it. And the summary point I would make is if you look at the trends, so rotate the question 90 degrees and ask not only are countries X, Y, and Z democracies above the line in terms of having uh, free and fair elections mm -hmm. to determine who rules, but what's the overall quality of democracy as measured by Freedom House, as measured by the Economist Democracy uh, Annual Index, and as measured, for example, by the varieties of democracy project that is um, uh, coded every year uh, in Sweden, a VDEM. And you can, and I did, create an annual measure that just uh, averages those three scores on a zero to 100 scale. And what I found, I didn't know what I would find going into it, although I had a suspicion, is that most of the big and important countries that have changed by, let's say, at least five points on that zero to 100 scale uh, since 2006, when I think the democratic recession began, have declined. Mm -hmm. Uh, including, by the way, of course, as you know, the United States. And very few uh, of the kind of weighty countries in population or income size mm -hmm. have improved. Of the countries that were democracies in 2006, in my judgment, most of them have declined, mm -hmm. uh, if yeah. they've declined, you know, appreciably yeah. by at least five points. So... Um the other parts of your lecture had to do with why this is happening and how we can reverse it, but maybe we can use that as a segue to okay. uh, open things up a little bit more and just talk about uh, your expectations for what's going to happen, because I really do think the year 2024 is going to be a really decisive year uh, for global democracy uh, in many respects. Uh, I would say that a year ago, I was feeling actually relatively confident about global democracy because you had an American midterm election where uh, many election deniers were on the ballot and uh, in important swing states at least, you know, almost none of them uh, won. Uh, Democrats actually did much better in that midterm than anyone expected. Uh, and the Ukraine war was going reasonably well. The Russians had been pushed back pretty consistently through the second half of 2022, but I would say that going forward, uh, we've got a lot of challenges, and I, I guess 
you know, we really do have to talk about the United States in that regard because I think it's the single most important democracy in the world. Uh, I did not think that in the year 2024 we would be confronting the kind of challenge to American democracy that we are seeing right now. Uh, but you have um, the leading Republican candidate who has been talking in much more explicitly authoritarian terms about what he would do uh, if they win the election in, in 2024. So what is your what is your sense of peril, uh, you know, at, at the present moment? Well, I basically uh, agree with everything you've said. So first, let me elaborate on my agreement, and then I'll answer um, your question about the degree of peril. I, um, the thing I most strongly agree with is that the U.S. is the most important democracy in the world, not only in terms of power, but in terms of that, you know, diffuse concept of zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, the uh, diffusion and demonstration effects that we can be in the United States a very important source of, and kind of the mood that is set in the world, the model that is set in the world, the sense of momentum uh, geopolitically that's happening in the world. And I think the democratic world, most of the democratic world, breathed an enormous sigh of relief uh, when Trump was defeated in 2020. Not so much Republican versus Democrat. A lot, lots of people in the world have different views about that and, you know, think that maybe this party or that party at this point in time or that would be better for them or their foreign policy or the global economy or trade or whatever. But our democratic allies disproportionately uh, and pretty uh, powerfully were worried about um, the direction Trump was going in, both in terms of damaging the brand of democracy, damaging the content of democracy in the United States, the democraticness of the United States, and damaging our democratic alliances and opening the way to the kind of authoritarian mischief that you, uh, or threats or aggression that you see in Ukraine and that Taiwan is faced with and that I would argue in a different way, but a way that we should not completely separate from this conversation, Israel experienced with the Hamas attack on October 7th. So um, that's one thing. If, but now we have an additional thing that's even more sobering, which is that Trump, first of all, Trump is being much more explicit and unapologetic about his authoritarian intentions. And, you know, we've learned from history, you have to take these people seriously in what, the, what they say they're going to do. And when he jokes about, I'll only be a dictator for a day, you know, it's code language. We know what he means by that. More disturbing to me than what he's saying is the much broader more intellectually and programmatically elaborated project around what he's saying, um, which I think is embedded in something that you care a great deal about, uh, as do I, but you've written more about it, which is um, the independence of the career civil service and the very explicit uh, and, I think, diabolical plan that um, Trump advocates and intellectual justifiers and people who are thinking about what a second Trump term should look like have to dismantle the career civil yeah. service. This is this Project 2025 that's yes. centered in the Heritage Foundation. And yes, and the very explicit plan, which you know, I invite you to say more about right now, uh, to take as many as 50,000 or more civil service positions and convert them, you know, going back to the dark days of uh, cronyism and corruption before the Pendleton Act and the establishment of the career civil service, which you talk about in your second volume on political order, 
Uh, and this would not just be a retreat to political crony cronyism and corruption and a dec decline in the quality of, uh, of public service. That would be bad enough. We know there's authoritarian intent there, that part of the purpose of this is to unleash the Justice Department, the IRS, the FBI, intelligence agencies as weapons against political opponents. And that's not just illiberal, that's authoritarian. So um, I'll complete the point about the United States by saying the following. If you study, uh, as we have had some authors do in the Journal of Democracy, what brings about a halt to a, an authoritarian slide? Or what brings about a reversal and a return uh, of the pendulum back to uh, democracy and constitutionalism? It turns out, it won't surprise you, it may surprise some of your listeners, that the career civil service is actually a pretty important element in this, just the state doing its job. Uh, he demonizes it as the deep state. We would view it as the democratic state, right? Mm -hmm. The professional career democratic state uh, adhering to the norms and rules um, uh, of, of, uh, of democratic government. And of course, related to that, and therefore not allowing themselves to be an instrument for any authoritarian project, committing to the neutral administration of government, of government services, uh, of law enforcement, mm -hmm. and so on. And then also the judiciary. And we know he's got a plan to politicize the judiciary uh, at every level, and that they've had a long-term project to put in more and more partisan uh, uh, and well, ideological they, they judges. Dis they discovered that it wasn't good enough. They've been taking all these Federalist Society nominees and getting them confirmed, but then it turned out that not all of them were reliable Trump right. supporters. Right. So they don't want to make that mistake again. They're going to get So one of, um, one of the things that leaves me for the moment a little bit hopeful uh, uh, about what might happen. Hopeful not in terms of being naive about um, Trump's authoritarian intent and the much greater running room that he will have in his second term to effect it, to realize it, but in terms of what some of the barriers will be um, is that Number one, in contrast to Hungary, it's really difficult to amend the Constitution in the United States. So I am seriously worried about an authoritarian trajectory if Trump is elected again. One of the things I am not worried about is Trump staying longer than the next four years. Uh, that he will not amend the Constitution to achieve that, and I don't think he'll be able to just put the Constitution aside. But when you consider how far along he could propel the United States toward authoritarian abuse of power mm -hmm. without amending the Constitution, it's scary enough. The second thing is we might get some limits on things mm -hmm. by the fact that even um, uh, very conservative uh, judges, and I think even a number of very conservative and Republican-leaning uh, Supreme Court justices, there are many things, but I, I don't think they're, uh, they're uh, uh, authoritarian in their mentality. But they could do a lot um, to bypass the judiciary, uh, and they could do a lot to choose more extreme judges. Yeah. And just to say one last thing uh, that uh, I am very worried about, and I suspect you are as well, and that is the lack of any courage at all on the part of almost all Republican members of Congress. And the ones that have shown courage, most of them are leaving. Liz Cheney was defeated. Yeah. Adam Kinzinger. 
is has decided not to run again. Several others, I think, with an with a revulsion at this, have decided not to run again, and Mitt Romney is not running again. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I think you could have a constitutional challenge in the following form. Uh, let's say that even this conservative Supreme Court uh, tells Trump, well, you cannot ban people on the basis of their religion from entering the country. Uh, and he just ignores them, you know, ignores the Supreme Court decision. I think, I think he's fully capable yes, of doing I that. Yes, I agree. And the Supreme Court doesn't have an enforcement authority. Uh, how many troops does the Pope have? Yeah. Uh, and so I think that sort of thing could happen. Uh, I would say that... That would be an impeachable offense, <laughs> but would these Republicans impeach him? Yeah, no, I no, don't think they, so. They wouldn't. Uh, and I would say that the agenda has shifted from, you know, a year or two ago when we said, well, these Republicans know the right thing to do, but they're just afraid of their own base and they're not standing up, you know, in the way that they know they should. What really disturbs me is um, that there's an increasing part of the population that actively supports, you know, this kind of authoritarian agenda. So, for example, when the issue of authoritarianism or Trump as a dictator was introduced into the lexicon, you know, uh, in, in recent uh, weeks, uh, it's actually, you know, poll data shows that Trump didn't suffer at all from this. And in fact, a lot of his base uh, actively likes that. And you think about the number of people that are not just silently enduring Trump, but are actively out there, you know, the whole MAGA wing of the, in the House of Representatives, all the figures. And then there's this interesting thing, um, Tim Alberto, who has covered the religious right very, I think, intelligently, just has a new uh, book on this. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of changes that have happened within American evangelicalism, where essentially the movement has become completely politicized. And what it means to be, for them, a devout Christian really doesn't have anything to do with biblical, you know, adherence. It, it really is completely political. Um, there's a new book uh, coming out uh, by Jonathan Rauch in which he makes this very interesting argument that mainstream Protestantism after World War II, in a way, became politicized. It became associated with kind of the progressive civil rights, you know, feminism, uh, all of these issues. And as a result, in a way, it lost a lot of influence because, you know, you didn't need the church to tell you that civil mm -hmm. rights was a good thing. Uh, and something like that has been going on on the religious right, where the religious content of Christianity is being replaced by this very overtly uh, political agenda. And uh, I guess the final thing I would say that's very worrisome is just the, the um, rhetoric about existential risk. You know, that it is such a common thing now to hear Americans say, the next election is going to determine whether America survives. And if the wrong party wins, that is the end of America. And that then justifies much more extreme responses. And so it's very easy to imagine if we have a close election, there's a dispute over various swing state, you know, uh, outcomes. Or if Trump wins and you have a lot of uh, Polish or Israeli style demonstrations on the part of people on the left, um, you know, and I, I sort of think that Trump and his friends are preparing for that. Yes, you know, uh, um, they want it. They, they want it in a certain because way. Because they would then want to invoke the Insurrection, Insurrection Act, Insurrection use Act. the military, and uh, have a clearer pathway yeah. to a more overtly authoritarian reality. Or their, or their supporters, you know, so many of whom are armed, and they've been told that they really need to defend uh, America from, you know, the threat uh, posed by the left. Uh, and so I, I can just foresee many very scary potential outcomes uh, next year. Well, it's interesting to hear you saying this, because you're usually more optimistic than I am. Um, I share your very deep concerns. I am extremely worried about the United States. And, you know, we can talk about other countries. I'm also, as you now know, very worried about the trajectory that India is headed in. 
and there'll be elections in other really regionally important uh, countries uh, like Indonesia and South Africa as well. And all of these countries, the U.S., India, Indonesia, South Africa, they're all headed downwards in terms of the quality and maybe even the viability of democracy. But keeping to the U.S. for a moment, um, let me offer a, a couple of additional thoughts. One, you know, and, and well, a few, and some of them will kind of put more flesh on the bones of alarm, and some of them may only slightly attenuate it. The greater flesh on the bones is that one of the things that really troubles me, and from talking to you, I think you as well, has been the growth of an intellectual and philosophical project justifying authoritarianism. So there's a religious dimension to it on the Christian right, but there's al also a political theory aspect of we're facing an existential threat uh, to our, you know, our Christian values and our way of life, and this justifies um, essentially the use of emergency overriding heroic executive authoritarian power to save the kind of country we want to have. And the have. jettisoning of liberalism as a framework for yes. understanding what the United States yes. is. Yes, and so um, I think we have a lot of work to do in defense of liberal democracy at many different levels and on multiple fronts, but we have to push back against this philosophical one and show its bankruptcy show how anti-American it is in terms of um, our values as a country, show how damaging it would be to American society, to our economy, to our leadership in the world, and how morally wrong it is, uh, frankly. So that's one thing. On the religious front, yes, I, I, I worry greatly about this, and I think... Uh, we are also hearing it. I haven't read Tim Alberta's book yet, but I think this is this is in uh, Tim's book because it's been in some of his reporting that a lot of the evangelical right, I think most of it knows how morally bankrupt Trump is personally, but they see him as the necessary instrument for the defense and achievement of the, the kind of values and the kind of society they want. And what worries me is that we're just pulling apart uh, culturally, psychologically, socially. Uh, there's just, it's like we're in a, a period of extreme centrifugal tendencies that are continuing on multiple fronts. And there's the glue holding us together as a society and a national community is, it just doesn't seem to be there. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to try to restore it. Now, I, I will say this will sound perhaps to some of your listeners like a partisan statement. I, I think Biden has been trying to do some of that. We share common democratic values. He's been trying to not be a polarizer in chief. Um, but his efforts at compromise, his efforts at dialogue, I think have largely been spurned. And the response is, we're going to impeach you because your son is a drug addict um, uh, who was a tax cheat. Uh, it's not a very uh, a democratic response in my view. And just the weaponization of impeachment uh, on groundless um, presumptions uh, is is part of the degradation of our democratic culture. Yeah, you and wonder if there'll ever be a future president that won't be impeached at this point. Yes, it's a fair question in the near term. Um, and then there's what's happening in more micro levels, including on our university campuses, which we're living through with on a, a daily basis where tolerance has declined, um, 
you know, people think the worst of one another. They treat one another, particularly online, in very abusive ways. And I think we now have, we do have some existential imperatives for our country and our democracy. And one of them is to find ways of depolarizing. And another is to reassert liberal and democratic values. I, there's never been a more important, urgently necessary moment in my lifetime for the relaunching, reinvention, reassertion, reinvigoration of civic education, democratic education, liberal education, not only in the universities, but, you know, starting uh, from elementary school on forward. And the decay of civic education, I'm kind of finding, is a global phenomenon. People t t take it for granted, you know, the, the adults in the room. Well, democracy is a given. We all know it's important. And you don't know what you don't know. If you're not educated in it, if you're not taught these values while you're growing up, if you're not taught the history of the Holocaust, uh, the, the, the civil rights struggle, the struggles for democracy and um, what, um, why we have these liberal institutions and values and why they're so connected to overarching uh, principles of human dignity from multiple religions. If you don't teach it, you can't assume they're going to learn it by osmosis. So I think we have an enormously important project in that regard. And the one other thing I'll say uh, about our cultural and psychological polarization, which, you know, several years after we got involved with the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford University, I have to say maybe you have a different answer. I still don't think we figured right, out right, is, is how we can um, arrest, uh, restrain, mitigate, the tendency of social media to be turbochargers and conveyor belts for disinformation, conspiracy theorizing, grandiose projects of domination, uh, perceptions of existential fear, and just demonization and, and hatred of the other. I mean, uh, the ongoing threat that social media of all kinds pose both as immediate conveyors of disinformation and fear and exaggeration and untruth in elections and then just this more existential atmosphere of ongoing polarization uh, it's just an enormous challenge and it's going to be as you know uh, it's going to be heightened dramatically as more and more of this gets put on an automatic AI uh, a footing of um, intensification. Yeah. Well, um, I guess the last thing to say is the way that the geopolitical situation has now completely merged with the domestic situation. So, as we speak, this is what I believe December 14th, something like that. Right. So, we're halfway through the month of December, and at the moment, uh, the prospects for further aid to Ukraine are dead because the Republican Party has pretty decisively said that they're not going to support uh, that. And in fact, you know, you get these uh, figures like J.D. Vance have just said, you know, I think kind of outrageous things about, uh, you know, blaming the Ukrainians basically for their own uh, predicament. Uh, and so that feeds into the domestic debate and the domestic debate then colors the way that the United States aligns. And I think that, you know, that's the single biggest source of weakness uh, for the United States as a superpower. It turns out our economy is going gangbusters, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's strange because nobody gives Biden credit for it, but low unemployment rate, inflation now is down, core inflation. And the Federal Reserve has announced that, that we can expect probably three rate cuts in the coming year. Yeah. Uh, so actually, economically, we're doing great, but you can't actually be a, a, a decisive power unless you can agree on what you're going to use that power for. And at this moment, we are horribly divided on that question. And so even the prospect of staying in our 
existing alliance structure with the NATO alliance, with well, Japan and Korea. I mean, that's all up in the air at the moment. So um, I want to amend one thing you said uh, and then reflect on the larger proposition, which I agree with. The macro economy is doing remarkably well. Uh, I think that it was not inevitable that we were going to have surging inflation. I think um, the Biden administration early on made a mistake. I believe it was an honest mistake and overstimulated and overspent. Larry Summers warned that this would lead to inflation. He turned out to be absolutely right. Um, and, and so we're, we're getting past it. But I think a lot of us who live on the coast in the knowledge economies, a lot of us who look at the macro numbers of declining inflation and uh, very low unemployment, are missing how much people are hurting um, by higher food prices, which aren't coming down. They've stopped going up, but they're not coming down. Just, I mean, you know, it's just more expensive to live. And by big structural changes in the economy that are making it very hard for young people to buy houses and leading a lot of young people and their families to agree with the general statement that this generation is not going to live as well or be as economically secure as their parents. And... Um, I do think this is the rising levels of economic inequality, the disproportionate gains of this great macro economy that are being captured by, first of all, a, a staggeringly wealthy uh, tech entrepreneurial um, segment of society within a few miles of where we're doing this interview, and then just by generally, you know, people in finance, people at the upper ends of business, uh, science, technology, uh, and, and frankly, you know, at the elite universities, uh, academia as well, we're not sensitive enough to this. A lot of people really, you know, feel uh, economically insecure and, um, and, and pinched, if not in a state of hardship. And so we, and it's going to get worse with AI. I am really worried about the displacement of jobs, good jobs under AI. So I think we have a lot of work to do in that regard. But it doesn't um, negate the broader point about what you're saying. So if we're getting ready part, to close... Part of that is comparative. Yes. You know, that uh, the United States is doing much better than China, for example, right now. Oh, absolutely. And better than most European countries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But the average worker um, uh, or job seeker or aspirational home buyer that's kind of doing okay, yeah. they're not um, wondering if they're going to put food on the table, but they're also depressed that they can't afford to buy a home, is not comparing themselves to their peer in... China or Italy, they're comparing themselves to their parents and others in the community around them. Anyway, um, what I wanted to say about where we're heading into is that, yes, on the one hand, it's bewildering that Biden doesn't get more credit, uh, e even given what I've said. And um, it might be that you know, we're still a year away, 11 months away from the election. So it might be that that will change. Um, but if it doesn't change, uh, we're going to be in, there's no question about it, for a very, very sobering period in, um, in American history and in world history for democracy. And on the one hand, I think we, we need to find ways to depolarize on the other hand, we need to be pretty outspoken and unapologetic in defense of democratic and liberal with a small L values. 
if you're looking for a silver lining in the early part of next year... We have to have one before okay. we can close this uh, so discussion. So I'll, I'll give you two interrelated ones. One is that one thing that's happened in the last 24 hours is that the House did pass, and pretty decisively, uh, the defense spending bill. Um, uh, and, you know, there were on the, on the right and the left kind of edges of each party, some people who voted against it, but a pretty strong bipartisan vote for it. And I do think there is some hope that early next year we could still get a compromise on uh, spending to support the three embattled democracies of Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, combined with um, tougher measures in terms of immigration. Um, I actually think President Biden is willing to withstand some blowback from the left wing of his party uh, to agree on compromise measures to spend more for border enforcement and to, I mean, we got to do something. Uh, it's, you know, the objective numbers are, are distressing, I think, about the fact that um, we have considerably lost uh, control over our borders. And this is not sustainable. You're, there's no country that is losing control of its borders that isn't going to have a right-wing populist reaction. It's just, it's just, I think it's a vir virtual sociological law. But the point is that, you know, that compromise will only happen if it's a compromise. Biden is not going to agree to the most extreme punitive anti-immigration measures that seem to be motivated as much by vindictiveness against uh, immigrants and their plight as by... Um, a, a desire to get control of our borders and 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 reduce the number of illegal immigrants. So um, it's gonna. I, I think what we're going to face in January is a real kind of litmus litmus test for Republican uh, members of Congress. Do they want to make progress in solving the immigration question, or do they want to only score political points? And. Um, we don't know the answer to that question mm -hmm. yet. Well, the, um, the way they behave in selecting um, a speaker for their own caucus uh, suggests that they're not laser focused on yeah. getting outcomes. But, yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. But we'll, we will have to see. All right, Larry. Okay, Frank. On that, uh, on that incredibly <laughs> inspiring <laughs> note, we will have to end this yeah. conversation. Let's, uh, let's hope for a better year than... Some analysts uh, think we should expect. Yeah. Okay, and we'll do this again next year, and okay. we'll see who is right and and uh, where we went wrong. <laughs>